1947, the archaeologist Henry Hornblur II built a living museum on the historic waterfront of Plymouth, Massachusetts. The living museum, which consisted of two English cottages and a fort, has grown significantly in the seven decades since its opening. In 1957, the museum added a full English village to its exhibit, as well as a Wampanoag home site in 1973, a visitor center in 1987, a craft center built in 1992, and barns that opened in 1994. The museum's other attractions, the Mayflower II, a replica of the ship that carried the pilgrims to Plymouth in 1620, constructed in 1957, and the Plymouth Grist Mill, which opened in 2013, are located a few miles away at the Plymouth waterfront. In July of 2020, the museum changed its name from Plymouth Plantation to Plymouth Patoxet to recognize the indigenous name for the region on which it sits. According to the museum's biography of its founder, his ambition was to bring the remarkable story of Plymouth Colony and the pilgrim struggle for survival to the people of America in the most effective way possible, by building a living museum. Plymouth Patoxet has expanded on its founder's ambition and now seeks to offer powerful personal encounters with history, built on thorough research about the Wampanoag people and the colonial English community in the 1600s. On November 16, 2019, we visited Plymouth Patoxet, then Plymouth Plantation, to see how the museum meets this goal. Today on Historia Nostra, we're visiting Plymouth Patoxet to experience the Wampanoag and early colonial history of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Coming into the museum's visitor center, we're handed a site map with details about each of the museum's exhibits on it, as well as a sheet telling us what each building is in the English Village on the backside of a Happening Today program. Guests are invited to watch a short introductory film here before heading outside to the museum. Before we head outside, the museum staff, seeing our cameras, advise us that we should head to the top floor of the fort, which apparently offers a great view of the English Village and is perfect for photos. Exiting the visitor center, guests walk along a trail lined with panels about the native plants and animals of the area, and are given some context for the first living museum exhibit along the trail, the Wampanoag home site located in historic Patoxet, the name for this Wampanoag territory along the Eel River. According to our site map information and panels along the trail, this reconstructed home site is based on that of Habamock, a Poconoke man who lived in this area in the 1620s with his family. It's really windy on the day we visit, and the harsh wind coming off the water has compelled the guides to stay inside and out of the cold, so we wander freely around the outdoor areas of the site. This exhibit focuses on day-to-day -day life for the Wampanoag in the 17th century, including the foods that were gathered, farmed, hunted, and fished in the area, and the processes of making mats and baskets weaved from reeds. The reed mat covered structure called a witu, and larger bark covered home called a nush witu, meaning house with three fire pits, represent the summer and winter homes used by the Wampanoag. There's also a mishun, or canoe, that's just been hollowed out with fire just past the first witu. The information on our map explicitly states that the guides at the Wampanoag home site, unlike interpreters in the English village, are not role players. According to our site map, all staff wearing traditional native clothing are native people, either Wampanoag or of another native nation. The museum has a formal partnership with the Mashpee Wampanoag and refers to its guides at the Wampanoag home site as cultural ambassadors rather than as historical role players, a key difference from the approach taken at other living museums. The museum asks guests not to wear costumes at this site and acknowledges that this is a culturally sensitive issue. Only Indigenous interpreters wear historically accurate clothing on site. Non-Indigenous guides wear Plymouth Patoxet uniforms, though both guides on site the day we visited were Indigenous. The museum's efforts to present Wampanoag history in an accurate manner that respects Indigenous heritage, technologies, cultures, and traditions is evident throughout the site. From the panels that prepare visitors for what to expect leading into the home site, to the guide's dress and interactions with guests, Visiting this site gave me the impression that
that the museum has a start here intentionally to prioritize the Wampanoag's relationship to this land and the indigenous history of this area. This prioritization successfully prevents the museum from appearing to sandwich the indigenous history in as an afterthought, as is often done in museums that focus primarily on settler histories. Although the Wampanoag home site is smaller than the English village, the order of exhibits makes the site's presentation of indigenous and settler histories feel balanced. Because of the cold and because it's a Saturday, there are few visitors on site the day we visit. We feel at ease speaking with the interpreters on site and have a conversation with one about ways of life in a Wampanoag home site in the 17th century, Wampanoag heritage, and the mushroom we notice outside which the guide tells us that they have just finished doing a 24-hour burn-on the night before. Yeah, so that is what we call machine in the Wampanoag language. It means a canoe. The whole process of making one of those is done by burning. The burning process does a lot of cool things for us, and not only just hollows it out, but it also forces it on the to the outside of the boat. So we ended up making it so it floats, but also watertight, water-resistant, boat-resistant. We're also told that we've chosen a good day for a visit because the weekends are the quietest days at the museum during fall, as large school groups are expected every weekday while the museum remains open in November. Exiting the Wampanoag home site, our next stop is the craft center. The winding paths and heavy tree line leading away from the home site create the illusion of distance as we move closer to the English village. Unlike other sites that ahistorically place their indigenous villages or interpretive sites immediately outside the settler's forts, Plymouth Pachoxit has evidently attempted to give the impression of distance between these sites. Placing the craft center between the English and Wampanoag sites complements this effort by extending the amount of time visitors will spend between them. There is a cafe and washrooms inside the craft center, as well as cases displaying artifacts largely pottery, spread out around the space. Here, visitors can view artisans creating items that would have been imported into Plymouth from England, and indigenous artisans making the items used in the Wampanoag home site. Today, there's an indigenous artisan working on headdresses. As we wander around, a man comes in with his two children and introduces himself to the artisan. He's evidently connected by marriage to the artisan's community, as he introduces himself by telling the man who his mother-in-law is. He explains that the artisan had made headdresses for his kids, but they damaged one and were there to see if he could fix it. This interaction was interesting for several reasons, but made it really clear that the museum has made an effort to bring in local indigenous artists, and that these indigenous artisans serve both the museum and their communities. After warming up and fortifying ourselves with hot coffee from the cafe, we ventured back outside. The trail brought us up to a site where the museum is building a new Nashwitu, and there are panels describing this work to visitors like me who wonder what they're up to. Moving past this, the next building we're brought into is the fort, which served as both a defensive building and as a meeting house for the pilgrims. This building isn't staffed, but, as promised, offers a great view of the rest of the English village overlooking Cape Cod Bay from its second story. There are cannons lining the exterior walls of the second floor here, pointing in all directions, making it unavoidably clear that the pilgrims' position here was not entirely peaceful. The English village is modeled after Plymouth in 1627, seven years after the Mayflower's arrival. The information on our map explains that they've chosen this date specifically because it's well documented, so there's a lot of information about this 1627 village available to historians, and because it represents a period just before settlers began to move out of Plymouth to settle in other towns. Moving into the village site, the costumed interpreters are going about their work and do not directly engage with us. Instead, the style of interpretation at this site invites visitors to wander around and observe the interpreters performing tasks like farming, collecting water, and chopping wood, but the role players will engage us if we directly ask them questions. Each costumed interpreter plays the role of somebody documented to have lived at Plymouth in 1627, and when they speak to us, they speak in 17th century English, which initially took us off guard. Each house is connected to one of the families who lived in Plymouth, 
and has role players inside like performing domestic day, tasks day, like, like yes. making sausage, stoking fires, and mending clothing. The museum warns guests that role players will always stay in character, and the video we watched in the visitor center advised us that it may feel like we're intruding on the interpreters in their private homes, but reminds us that we're welcome to explore all areas of the exhibit. Initially, we thought this warning was peculiar and didn't think much of it, but being in the space, we were constantly reminding ourselves that we were allowed to be in those spaces. It initially felt uncomfortable to go into the buildings and interact with the guides, because it did feel like we were barging in on their private spaces, and were nothing if not overly polite Canadians. But, after wandering around the first few homes, we felt more at ease and engaged more confidently with the role players. Perhaps no. too confidently There's for me, so as here. I found myself unintentionally mimicking their British accents and historical language as we moved through the site, which was pretty embarrassing in hindsight. The style of interpretation in the English village is markedly different than that in the Wampanoag home site. In the Wampanoag home site, the guide spoke to us in modern English and as educators. In the English village, the role players speak to us as 17th century historical figures and do not acknowledge that they're part of a museum exhibit. The role players greet us as we enter the houses, introduce themselves to us as their characters, and tell us what they're doing. They often engaged in conversation with us, such as by asking if we are new to Plymouth and where we were from. When we told them we were from Canada, they would often look at us aghast and ask if we are French or dare they ask, as good Puritans, Papists? A historical term for Catholics. Hmm. What of yourselves? Are you settled in New World somewhere? We Canada. come from Canada, yes. Oh! Hmm. Yes. So you are French? No. <laughs> no. No. Are you not afraid of the French? They have a fort at Quebec? They do, yes. Yes, so I've heard. Mm -hmm. Dangerous. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're Papists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After these conversations, the interpreters would either return their attention to the task at hand to allow us to explore their home, or would continue to ask us questions and stare somewhat confusedly at us when we returned modern answers. After we visited each building in the English village, we wound our way back to Nye Barn, which houses some of Plymouth Plantation's livestock and panels about the animals kept in Plymouth in the 17th century many of which are now rare breeds that can be seen at the museum today. There's also a llama in the barn, even though llamas weren't used in Plymouth, because they're good at protecting herds from predators like coyotes. Plymouth Patoxit is part of a global effort to save several heritage breeds, many of which now have critically low breeding populations. Leaving Nybar brings us back to the visitor center and parking area. Plymouth Patoxit is, in most ways, a model living museum that others should strive to meet. If pushed to offer a critique of the site, I would point out that the museum oversimplifies the pre-contact history of this region, but because this is only really referenced in the introductory video guests are shown at the visitor center, does not constitute a serious faux pas. Personally, I was really impressed by the way the museum evidently engages with current scholarship about the history of Plymouth, and with local indigenous communities to strengthen the accuracy and educational value of the living history presented here, including with the University of Massachusetts Boston, who've been working on an archaeological project in collaboration with the museum since 2013, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, and General Society of Mayflower Descendants. The museum also houses the Center for 17th Century Studies at Plymouth, which includes a collections and research library that is open to researchers. This emphasis on fostering and supporting continued research and presenting accurate histories to visitors complements and evidently influences the museum's approach to living history and the material provided to the museum's guides. Unlike other museums where guests must read traditional museum displays to get a good history of the site and where the interactive exhibits function primarily to entertain, Plymouth Patoxit strikes a balance between these two forms of teaching history in its living museum exhibits. 
The information visitors need to understand the site is given either on panels strewn around the trails and in the exhibits, or on the handouts given when tickets are purchased, meaning that guests can get a good history of this region's indigenous and settler past by experiencing the museum's living exhibits. If you'd like to learn more about Plymouth Patoxet or the Pilgrims and their history, check out the resources in the description. Footage from my trip to Plymouth was provided by Graham Christie, and our theme music is by Brook for Free. You can learn more at brookforfree.bandcamp.com.